great, great. Okay, Gideon, I take it that either you are a monk today or you're a cold. <laughs> Mostly just it's okay. To That's be okay. That's okay. You'll make Adrian feel very good. He's a Romanian monk. So what can you do? <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll leave monk status in a moment. I'm just a little chilly. All right. All right. Well. Okay. So I will. We'll. We'll all be. We'll all be hooded in our own different kind of uh, ways. Okay. You can keep it on. That's fine. I. It's. It has a good style of mystery to it. <laughs> uh, all right so i remind me towards the end i am sort of thinking that instead of us doing that next poem he sits for me i think it makes more sense for us to read the um uh the essay uh on gilui vichisui bilashon on revealment and concealment then we'll come back to the poem because I, I think there are different ambiguities of the poem so i'll come back to it at the end but i think i'm going to switch things around a little bit in terms of uh, the uh, this, let me just make sure. Okay, so Mattel has gone dark, and we'll see how we're we're going to proceed. All right, so we're going to um, uh, everybody. I, I I trust has now received the mints. I I looked at all the uh, the other translations, and they all um, garble it in different ways. Uh, and and I think that the mints translation, which I came across. Uh, much later than when I had sent things originally to Tzvi is the is the best and most effective. But as we've done before, I'm going to um, be going through the text and 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 try to uh, bring things uh, clear. Did, does anybody know? Have heard from uh, uh, Aditya Harshand? Adi is. Um, I don't see that he's on. I don't know whether, um, but no one no one knows him independently. Okay. So we'll see, hopefully he'll come on to the screen. So this is um, a somewhat epical style poem, is Habrecha, means the pool. Um, and it has uh, numerous levels of signification. Um, uh, and we're gonna see that it really reflects uh, many of the themes that we've been dealing with so far in terms of subjectivity, light, but it will also be turning in a, a, a very important way to the relationship between inner experience and language. Um, and we already saw that in the poem, Echad Echad, one by one, where remember, he hopes that there will be the return of the inspired spirit of illumination, which will be this silent voice uh, of this turua, this call that comes, that's ne'elemet, that is silent. Uh, and this relationship between language and speech, between witness and testimony, will be something that we are going to uh, be uh, returning to uh, on a number of occasions. So when I, uh, I want to go through the translate, I want us to do this somewhat slowly, and I want to do it in the uh, Mintz translation, and we'll read the, uh, the Hebrew. Um, I want to just begin by um, initiating a number of queries so that you can have some things in your mind. And then if you have some issues you want to bring at the beginning before we turn to the poem itself. So the first thing that I would just, I'm not going to yet argue for it or discuss it, but I just want to raise these issues. So the question that begins is, the poet begins, Aniodea, I know. So the first question we want to ask ourselves will be, what is the nature of the subject and subjectivity? Who is the I that speaks? Who is the I that is speaking? And what is the knowledge? Or put differently, what is the difference between uh, worldly knowledge and poetic knowledge? How do you come to know something as a poet as opposed to the way you would know something from another point of view, philosophical or prosaic and not necessarily scientific, but that you there is a kind of a cognition. What is the nature of poetic cognition, what does he know and where does he know it? 
where is this knowledge located? Is the knowledge located in the outside world or is it a feature of his subjectivity? Which is to say, if his eye and his knowledge is an aspect of his subjectivity, we want to know where the pool is located. Is the pool only in nature, something that he remembers from his past? Or is the pool something of his inner eye, E-Y-E, his eye that sees? And if the pool is also his inner eye of perception, and not just the eye that sees something in the external world, then the most fundamental issue of poetics, not just of this poem, comes to light, which is to say, what is the nature of reflection? What is being reflected? In poetic terms, we think of the word mimesis, right? Imitation or representation. What is the relationship between the world as seen as the world as represented? Or the world as seen and the world that's reflected in the mind's eye or the brecha or the pool that's his soul? Which is the true world? Which is the true world for the poet? And does it make a difference if there is also an external world? And the, we're also going to try to determine um, what is the poet see as the relationship between expression of his inner world and silence. Because the paradox is that he speaks language about the silence which then begins to raise another question that we're going to have to focus on is what is the time? What is the time? What is the poetic time that is being described? Where is the poet located in time? Now, one aspect of time, as we will see, is the time of the day and the time of seasons. That's one way of measuring time right, the different fluctuations. But where is the poet located when he says, I know at the beginning, but in his knowledge at the beginning of his I know, he is not absolutely certain what the pool is imagining, right? I'm not sure what it's dreaming. But at the end of the poem, he will reveal to us the inner imagination that he knew as a child of what the imagination of the pool was or is, which is presumably still his consciousness from the very beginning. So in other words, the poet is says he knows, but then he's going to um, bring us into a um, description of something that was much more profoundly known from a child's consciousness? Or is that the consciousness that he's trying to recover as a poet? What is he trying to do as a poet? Because as a poet, he's describing the forest and he's describing the pool. And then at a later point, he will say that there's a deeper knowledge here that although I'm putting it into language, it transcends that. So I think we want to bear in mind, is this a poetic meditation on mimesis? On how do you represent the inner and outer world? And what are the different levels of representation that appear that affect the nature of the ani. That is the dominant um, pun, isn't it? Or the play on words. The ani, I, which will play off against I in nothing, but it plays off against I in, which is the I 
as well. So the ani and the ayin will be playing the, the I as a singular subjective I, the I that sees, and also the ayin, which is the nothingness with an aleph. And it moves through the poem between the subjective I, the nothing, and the I that sees, right? Or the I that perceives. So here we have a poet who is talking about perception, right? And he's trying to help us understand um, this mystery of perception. So that the first thing I want us then to be aware of is um, who, who is speaking and what is the nature of the image where, and where are the image is located, right? Are they both external or internal or mostly internal and he's projecting them outward? And then the issue is what is the relationship between time and space? between the shifting images of perception and locality, the topos. Where is that space located as well? Is this simply a inner space or is it an outer space? How does a poet deal with the inner uh, and the outer space? So we have the subject, we have time, and we have space and the whole mystery of representation. Is this a poet who's trying to think about what it means to be a poet and where his images are? Or is he simply a nature poet? And he's simply describing something of the external world. The other thing that, um, uh, which I want really much, I really want your help with, a number of you have different kinds of experiences about that. And I'm really puzzling a lot, we, we raised it before, and that is, how do we understand um, the mysticism that's presented in secular terms? Now, some of you may know, I'm sure that Adrian knows too, um, Zainer, who, is a, who had been a professor of uh, Hinduism and a professor also, he wrote a book on the Bhagavad Gita in, in Oxford, at one point wrote a book called Sacred and Profane Mysticism, or Mysticism Sacred and Profane. And the book was actually stimulated by his rejection of Aldous Huxley's famous book on the doors of perception of whether you see the world differently when he was taking mescaline. And what is the nature of perception under altered states? And that was sort of the stimulus for him to write this, but then he goes on to describe um, poets like Rambeau and, they, and essayists like Proust who are giving us mystical experiences, but are not religious in any theistic sense, but they're using unitive language or mystical states. And we're going to see that Bialik doesn't speak as in theistic or monotheistic terms by any stretch of the imagination. He's not a traditional Jew in terms of the way he describes the world, but he uses numerous phrases from classical Jewish mysticism. And I think the, the question we want to begin to ask is, how do we understand a poet who is bringing us into a profound mystical religious state of consciousness, who uses traditional language but whose world that's being described is secular, if we can talk about to be secular and religious at the same time. As he's firmly embedded in the world of nature, but it's not just nature poetry. There's a religious quality about this. And in the description, he's using traditional Jewish mysticism language. And I think it, it presents a really a, a, a question about religious poetics or the poetics of description of how we go about thinking about the status of the language of the poet 
when he uses mystical language, but he's not mystical in any traditional sense. And yet he's not just experiencing the world of nature in some kind of a pantheistic sense. Okay, so we'll go a little bit more deeply into that. Um, but before we do, I just wanna know if, if anything that I said so far about these kind of opening comments trigger anything or questions that you want to begin raising because I want to make sure that we're on the same uh, page. These are just like the four or five topical issues that are extremely, uh, that struck, that, that leap out to me uh, and I will be coming back to, but I wanted to make sure that uh, they're clear to you or you have, uh, want some clarity or you want to kind of raise another kind of an issue. Are these methodological or framework issues helpful? I'd like anybody to, to talk so I know that the cat doesn't have your tongue. <laughs> anybody want to say anything? I'd like, I'd like to hear. Yes, Anissa. Um, I, so what came up for me in hearing the end of what you were speaking about with the secular and religious is, is this like a true divide, <laughs> so to speak? Um, and I, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how, like, I understand that we have religious spaces and secular spaces, yeah, yeah. but I don't know if, if creative folks or Bialik is really creating this poetry in that sort of divisive framework. And so I'm wondering if we could maybe talk a bit about that. I, I, I do want to come back to, let me just at least make an interesting hint. And it's actually a book that I was just reading, uh, the other day, I, I don't know, Adrian, whether you're aware, it's, there was a, um, there's a French book that was done right after the Second World War. Um, it's, uh, let me, uh, I'll actually show it to you. Um, the French is Situation de la Poésie, The Situations of Poetry. And um, it was, it was written um, both by Jacques Maritain, who is a, a well-known uh, Catholic philosopher, and his wife, Raisa. And Raisa has one of the earlier essays. And in a certain sense, she answers your question in a, in a very interesting way. What she really says is that all is given by God as a gesture of love, but the poet is only focusing on the external images of the world and trying to build a framework, but what is given, she's trying to keep a religious framework, but trying to understand what a secular poet would be doing, that the religious poet wants a more unitive contact with the God of love, because she's speaking as a Catholic, but the Secular poet is simply working with nature images and trying to enhance those images, even though those images are coming from the divine. But the nature poet is not necessarily either aware or concerned with that, but more concerned with enhancing the images of the, of the created world, okay? But from her point of view, it all comes as an expression of divine love. So she's trying to deal with that as a Catholic. Uh, Adrian, are you aware of that? Uh, that, that, that no, no, I'm not. It's, it's actually a very, so I think you, you'll find it very interesting. Jacques Eraïsa Maritain, and they, uh, he was a very famous um, uh, neo thomist uh, Catholic philosopher who actually came and spent the last part of his life in Princeton. He also wrote on art um, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, it, it begins to raise that hard question that we've been seeing. Is there such a thing as secular mysticism? Can you use traditional language and not mean anything traditional? Uh, and can you uh, retrieve that language, which is the most powerful language of the tradition, and yet mean something totally different? Aim at something else, which for Bialik is really to experience the mystery of the manifest world and not to come in contact necessarily with God in any sense. But he will use the word God and God's revelation in some interesting ways in the poem as well, 
but not as a traditional Jew by any stretch of the imagination. So it's a puzzling issue, and I've been thinking about it a lot because it will help us try to understand what is the nature of poetic religious language or romantic language, the language of the romantics, or people who use this kind of language uh, but don't intend a theistic or a monotheistic perspective. Okay, so that's a that's more of an answer than I was intending, but that that will get us going. Anybody else want to kind of raise anything at this point? All right. So uh, let us begin by first just focusing on the opening stanza, and we'll go through the images um, slowly. Hopefully, we can do this in one class, but we'll see how we want to go. I don't. Um, will someone kind of read the opening in English and then? Um, Ido is our uh, man for all uh, recitations, and he'll read it in Hebrew for us. Who would like to read it in English? The, the opening, the opening one, which I think is a kind of a prologue. The, there's a kind of prologue, then there are a series of images of the day, and then we'll see at the end there's a meditation uh, on poetic and mystical experience at the end. Okay. Is that first stanza there? Yeah, the one that begins, I know a forest. And the, okay. just, just the opening lines. Who would like to read it? I can Oliver, read. great. Okay. The pool. I know a forest, and in that forest, I know a hidden pool. In the denseness of the wood isolated from the world, in the shades of a lofty oak, blessed by light and accustomed to storm, alone she dreams dreams of an inverted world and spawns secretly her golden fish, but no one knows what is in her heart. Okay, Ido, why don't you just read that opening part? I know a wind and a wind, I know a wind, 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 a Okay, so let me begin by um, expressing a few things and see what your response is. So this, this, in a certain sense, opens the poem with a series of thematics that will unfold in a variety of different ways as the poet uh, moves forward. It begins, of course, with Ani, Yodea, I know. And that's going to be the counterpoint. Who is the I and what does the I know? Is the I that knows simply the I that is remembering something? Or is this a different kind of, what is the nature of the subjective knowledge that he knows of this? Or is he just knowing a locale? We're going to see how he emerges from this. I know a ya'ar, a forest, and in the forest, I know of a burecha, a pool, and here it's translated as a hidden pool. Sinua is modest. It's hidden. It will play also on the term sin'a that he will use later in the poem, which is really hidden. So there's a kind of modesty of the pool for the reader who knows this from the perspective of medieval Jewish mysticism, the pool is the lowest level of the divine gradations of mystical unfolding as we would understand it in Neoplatonic terms. It's a, it's a mirror, the pool becomes a mirror and what shines in the mirror what shines in the pool are the reflexes in the lower realm of the higher realities. So this pool, he will use as it's commonly used in medieval Jewish philosophy and in medieval Jewish mysticism as a reflecting point of worldly happenings. It is going to be so then that raises the question, where is that pool? Is, because we'll see at the end, that pool is really a reflecting eye. It's an eye of perception, right? Or it's the eye of that a master of mystery, 
right? He used, and talks in kind of mythic terms of this, uh, the, the, the Sar, the, 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 the mighty conjuring divine that knows secrets of the world. But it's, it's as if the pool is the eye of perception that's embedded in the world, that's seeing out. But he, as the poet, knows already from the beginning that this brecha is a reflecting pool. And the question is whether it's the inner eye, it's the soul, and it's not that he's using that external image to deal with it. Now, they, that pool that he knows is in the thickness of the choresh, the thickness of the wood. But pay, we will come back to this. Pay attention to the word choresh. There are several key words which we call a light motif or light verter, words that repeat themselves over and over again. Ido um, uh, uh, would be called in the Hebrew, it's milot uh, mancha, the kind of repeated words that, uh, but a choresh, he will play on the tone harishit, secret or silent. So there's this issue of this inner place is a place of secrecy and silence. And we'll see towards the end, it's the place that transcends language. It is a locus that's in place, but a locus that's in the mind and the imagination. And the question is, what does the imagination draw upon? Does it simply clean out its own reflecting soul so that it reflects the outer world? Or does the eye bring something to that? So he, and then he says it's in the Choresh, in this thick wood, Pirusha Min Ha'olam. Again, he's coding certain kinds of things. Pirusha is, has the overtones of being an ascetic. An ascetic is Parush. So it's not just a pool that's separated in an isolated place. It has this monist, monastic quality. It's something that's separated from the natural world. It's something that is isolated. It's something that is distinctive. Min ha'olam, right? It's, so, in, for, for, so the person who's hearing this is already asking the question, what is the status of materiality when something is parush min ha'olam, that is separated from the world, in the world of Jewish mysticism, it's pure spirit and not nature or materiality. Or does the poet really mean that it's simply separated as a locus? Or does he bring the two together? It's separated as a locus, but it's somehow separated from mere sensuality. It is going to be a lens that is gonna capture something more ethereal, something more spiritual. I'm not going to, we'll see how he moves with that. And then he goes on, Livadat Hachlom. So there's a kind, it, it has its own status. It's Livad, Livadi. And he speaks of himself as a poet, as Livadi, myself, the subjectivity. So he's already hinting that this is something related to him as the poet. And it dreams, the dream of Olam Hafuch. So this is a very important, um, uh, now you, I think one of the poets, uh, you said, a world upside down or upturned. It's, it's not, so in, in the Talmud or rabbinic literature, Olam Hafuch is the same world that we often find in the romantic poets or the romantic painters. Have you ever seen uh, how, uh, how the poets, or let's say the painters will paint the image of the sky and the clouds in the water or the overhanging branches. That doubling of reality, which is fundamental to romantic poetry, is part of what's being captured here. Olam hafuch means he's capturing the transcendent upper world in the lower world, right? That the olam hafuch, the upturned world, is that it's a reflex at the level of imagery of the upper world, right? And that's going to be part of the larger problematic of the poet, right? When a poet catches externality, trees, sun, 
light, color in the eye, is that simply being reflected immediately or is it a mimetic reflection that goes through his imagination and it's transformed? Can the poet's reflecting soul, can the poet's reflecting eye be the pure mirror of this brecha, of the pool? Or is the pool itself only a second order reflex of reality, right? So for traditional Jewish and Christian and Islamic philosophy, the philosopher, the philosopher's mind or the mystic's mind, and Bialik has this in his head, but the philosopher's mind or the mystic's mind or in the Talmud, Moses, who is the true prophet and the true philosopher, has a clear consciousness. To have a clear consciousness means that the transcendent reality, or from this point of the poem, the world of external forms, play on the pool in the most exacting reflection. Reflection not being a refraction, but being they are ca actually capturing the imagery of the externality. So he's already dealing with the, our, the, the central problem of religion and the, of revelation or the central problem of poetry. What is being reflected in the poet's eye? What does the world reflect if the world itself may be in religious terms, a manifestation of higher realities, perhaps only in material form, but it contains spiritual realities from a higher source of truth, right? The poet is simply talking that same language, but now in a more secular language. How do you receive the truth of external perception? And to what degree does the receiver transform them? So the pool is dreaming chalom olam hafuk. It's dreaming the dream of this pure perception, of pure receptivity. V'tadgela b'chashai et the gezahava. And it kind of um, breeds all these, the golden fish, the light that's coming down into the pool, which are really like the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the golden light, are perceived as if these are like goldfish that are swimming in the sea, but they're reflecting the golden light. And they are, uh, the, 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 teeming, the teeming light that's in the pool is the teeming light that's coming from some transcendent source. But now this is the key turn, which we'll see, we'll wait till the very end of the poem. The Aniodea, remember it began, Aniodea, I know, right? And then he says again, Aniodea, and he concludes this stanza, the Aniodea, Ma Bilvava. And no one, Ain, no one knows what is in her heart, right? In other words, is there something already deeper than the dreaming pool? Who knows what is the pool's imaginative dream as it's seeing that external world? I, I'm stressing this because at the very end of the poem, he will say that he once knew the dream of the pool. Right now, he's speaking as it were from a later perspective that he knew of this pool and he knows something about it. And he's going to actually describe its multi-form appearances, but he has forgotten, as it were, what the dream of the pool is that's receiving external nature. And at the end of the poet, he's actually going to recover that primary consciousness of the child that knew that. Anybody have any other thoughts? Notice also that he says that this popular tree, this leafy oak tree is Baruch Or. 
is blessed of light, right? Right. It's a it's a streaming, and of course, it's a pun on Baruch and Berecha, right? There's a the blessedness is him is streaming into the Berecha. Anybody have any thoughts so far? Just as the opening, or what we've been talking about of mimesis, reflection, imagery, anything that comes to your mind that you want to kind of bring up at this point. Is this just nature imagery or is he already speaking um, uh, as, um, as a person who's trying to receive some inner truth about the world? Or to come back to Anissa's issue before we Edo's question, is the task of the mystical poet to become as completely aware of worldly manifestation as possible so that the descriptive imagery is really a way of manifesting manifestation? And, be, and to be like the pool. There's, there's no gap between what the poet is trying to write and the reality that's being portrayed, right? That the poet is trying to give us manifestation. And in that sense, to be like a pool that is manifesting what is coming down. Does that, all right, let's say Ido, you had a question from the beginning. I mean, you. You just kind of answered. Um, my question was about kind of do we assume the hierarchy that we maybe assume when we talk about mimesis? Like, is is do we assume that the the role of the poem here and of the poet is necessarily kind of to reflect truth uh, in its in its most um, unmediated form? Uh, is mimesis necessarily um, uh, which implies something that is not absolute? Um, is it necessarily bad, quote unquote, or, or um, you know, in the essay that we read in, in for the first class, Miron, who we, I don't really, you know, follow that, and I know you don't either, but he, he sees this as a symbolist manifesto, this poem together with the revealment and concealment essay, where the whole point is kind of to distort um, or, or to give a personal kind of uh, uh, reflection of it. And the other thing I thought that was interesting here is um, since we've been talking about light is also to think about kind of the poetics of, of water um, and, and what water means. And I think especially um, in, in the context of Bialik and the concept of um, uh, and, and, and the dream that he opens his um, novella Safia with uh, 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 of walking in the desert and, and seeing the river and sitting on the bank of the river and, and looking into the water. And I know there's a lot here and, and maybe it's a bit of a, but uh, the idea of water and, and light both being something so that has to do with reflection and with vision. Good, all right. So let me, I don't want to get into too deeply, but let me just pick up on a couple of the issues. Um, num, num, number one, I think uh, part of what you're raising is the issue of what po of poetic truth. For the poetic truth, is that manifest world. It is the manifest world. It's not that there's a divine behind that, it, but it's, it's experiencing the manifest world in its, the fullness of its manifestation. It may come from God, but the secular poet will not want to come in contact with God. We want to come in contact with the blessing of light that's being revealed, right? So we're gonna have to see that. I agree with you. I, do not agree with Meron's notion. I don't think there's a symbolic distortion. I think that as we'll see towards the end, Bialik wants to receive the gift of manifestation that's beyond language. And that's why we, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at the, his essay on language after, but, he, I, the, the, but the question is, what does the poet want to do with language? Not simply to distort the world, but that the world will become, each word will become a mirror of reflection of that level of experience. So we're gonna to have to come back to this issue. I think the issue of water that you're raising is very important. And I would simply say one interesting thing in this regard, and that is 
that for medieval Jewish mysticism, and I think it's also in Sufi mysticism, I wish that Adi was here, we could, we could ask him, but I know some, some texts that I've read, what mystics actually do in not just look at a pool, but there was a whole technique of looking at water and one's reflection in the water, looking into a pool or looking into a, a basin. There are many, many techniques that we know from the medieval period that this was a form of contemplative of contemplation. So this relationship between water, reflection, and so on and so forth, it has many other overtones in terms of mystical ascension in the Middle East, but we'll come back to those. Okay, anybody else want to pick up on something? Yes, Oliver. Um, thinking about uh, perception, I, I thought just might be um, helpful to bring up the notion that um, it's not entirely one-sided. And what I, what I mean by that is that, you know, we philosophers and have often doubted the idea that we directly and accurately perceive the world. And also that we um, kind of bring something, some sort of an a, a assembly with our perceiving of the world that we sort of denote that we bring a, a certain meaning when we begin to perceive the world, that it's not just a, a one-way uh, uh, relationship. And I think that, that I thought that- was I, I agree. So we have, just to problematize it, what does, what does the poet desire, right? The, how, how does the poet deal with subjectivity that may distort? How does the poet become passive to be a receiver? Or the, the poet's task is to be both a receiver and a maker, a poesis, to receive and to reflect back, right? It's not simply an internal state, or at least for Bial, it's not just an internal state of surrealism or, uh, or something that's going on in one's inner mind, but he's trying to describe something. So that relationship between passive receptivity uh, and dealing with subjectivity and the subject that is a maker is going to be an issue. So let's let's begin with the um, the next uh, uh, the next paragraph, uh, the one about Boker, the morning. So uh, who'd like to read that? All of you want to continue as long as you do that so nicely. Maybe you read one more paragraph. Sure. Uh, yeah, and then. Uh, <clears throat> In the morning, when the sun washes the locks of the forest's majesty and pours a sea of radiance over his curls, he, the mighty one, all of him an expanse of golden nets, stands willingly captive, like Samson in Delilah's hands, with a faint smile and a lover's illuminated face, aware of his strength. In the golden mesh of himself, he accepts his bonds affectionately, lifts high his garlanded head beneath the powers of the sun, as if to say, flood me, curl me, or bind me. Do with me whatever your heart desires. At this hour, the pool, granted or not granted, a single golden ray from above, grows languid in the shade of her many-branched shield. Quietly, she nurses his roots, and her waters grow tranquil, as if rejoicing silent in her lot. Privileged to be a mirror for the forest mighty one. And who knows, perhaps she dreams in secret, that not his image or his roots alone within her lie, that all of him grows within her. Lovely. So, Ido, you want to read, and then we'll reflect on this. Baboker, Birchotza Shemesh, Machlefot, Geon Ayar, Veyam Shel Zor, Al Taltalav Tishpoch, Vehu Haitan, Misheta Hermei Zahav Kulo, Lirzono, Keshimshon Bide Lila, Omed Nilkad, Mitoch Srok Kal, Veor Pne Ohev Margish Koho, ברשת פז של עצמו, מקבל אסוריו בחיבה, ומרים על ראשו נזרו תחת גבורות שמש, כי אומר לה, שיתפיני, סלסליני או איסריני, ועשי בימה שליבך חפץ. 
הבריכה בשעה זו, אם תזכה ואם לא תזכה, בקרן אחת זהב מגבוה, התעלף לה בצל מגינה רב הפוערות, מניקה חרש את שורשיו ומימיה ישלו. כאילו שמחה היא בחלקה דומם, שזכתה להיות ראי לחסין היער. ומי יודע, אולי חולמה היא בסתר, כי לא רק צלמו עם יונקתו בה, אך כולו גדל הוא בתוכה. begin with just a couple of comments and see what your response is. So the first thing for a person who's reading it in the Hebrew uh, is, is the erotics of the imagery. The erotics of the sun that washes over the treetops and the branches, which are the machlafot, The machlafot are the curls or the extensions of the locks of the hair. Or in the third line in the Hebrew, which is translated here as the curls, the tal talav is the word that appears in the Song of Songs, right? That the locks are of a certain type uh, when it's describing the male beloved or as God in the Song uh, of Songs. And then even stronger, The imagery has this highly eroticized quality by playing on all the language of the, of, from the book of Judges about Samson and Delilah. If you look in chapter 16 of Samson and Delilah, you'll see that the poet has eroticized this as, a, as an erotic coupling, that the light that drenches the trees and that it comes out is as it were Delilah who is in, entrancing, captivating his hair and totally uh, putting him into an erotic desire and erotic trance. And all the terms that are being used, he not only says Kishimshon bide Delilah, Samson, but don't forget the word Shimshon plays on that opening word Shemesh of sun, right? The, uh, and then he, uh, then he talks about um, that the golden streams, uh, 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 he receives asurav bechiba, her, her binding. But to be bound in love is an old imagery that also appears in the book of Judges. She, she entrances him, she puts a trance into him or He says that he can't be harmed if no one cuts his hair, right? But she is the one who will um, uh, cut his hair. He also, the next line that says in our uh, text, um, um, lifts high his garlanded head, totally misses the pun here because Samson was a Nazarite, a Nazir. And here, it's, what's translated here, unfortunately, as garlanded head is Rosh Nizro, which can be the crown of one's head, but it's talking about the hair, the crown of the trees, which is as if it were Samson um, who is being in transit. And what does the tree say? It uses three words that are both erotic and have a quality of mysticism about it. Here in the translation is flood me, curl me, bind me. So here it's shitfini. I think uh, this was a term we had to be drowned in love. We saw this in the earlier poem, right? Just uh, flood me and drown me. But now he's saying, he's saying flood me, entwine me, bind me. But to be bound in love, to be entrapped. And then he uses the language, everything that your heart desires. So the... The language here of uh, experiencing nature in this erotic way of the tree, uh, in a certain sense, what, what Bialik has done in this remarkable way um, is he's restored the narrative of Samson and Delilah, of Shimshon, to its original, to a sun myth. Uh, some of you may have known, There, there were theories, maybe it was even a theory when Bialik was writing the poetry, that the language, that Samson and Delilah was originally some kind of a sun myth, of sun 
and so on and so forth. And then it became humanized and anthropomorphized and somehow he became this kind of earthly hero, but that was, it was based on an earlier myth. To a certain degree, what Bialik has done is remythicize the imagery of light, sunlight, forest, and the trees. And the, po the poem, is midway between its allusion to a biblical narrative and to a mythic allusion, right? So if you're trying to understand the poet's language, we're trying to say, how does he balance between a historical narrative of a hero, nature imagery, and some allusion to some mythic quality of being subsumed by the sunlight, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then of course, all the imagery here. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to come back before I hear your response, when you go back to the uh, bottom, the second to the last line in English, quietly she nurses his roots and her waters grow tranquil. So here's cheresh is silently that's, pin, that's playing off in that word, remember choresh, of the wood. But now you can see the erotics of not, not the sunlight that's washing over in this uh, way, like Delilah, but the waters of the pool are the suckling waters of the tree itself. There's a collapsing of these, of the light imagery and the water imagery simultaneously. And it's the water of the pool that is giving suck or suckling the roots of the tree, right? So there's a highly erotic image of the pool now, which is, which is a mother earth. It's a mother imagery. We're gonna see the different kind of imagery. Now it's a mother image that's supporting the erect high oak tree, the alone, right? and is giving the water or the sustenance as the mother's breast um, to the tree. Um, and then you can see it, then you can see in the end, she says, and again, I have to change uh, the translation. That she has merited. Zachta is a, is a biblical and rabbinic term. She has merited because of what she has achieved to be the pool or the reflecting light of this master of the forest. And who knows? So now the poet is saying, and who knows? He's not yet on the inside or that he will be that he was as a child or he will be again. Umiodea, the who of knows. Who is the one who knows? Ulai, perhaps she dreams in secret that she's not only the image of him in her, but that she is the source of his very being, okay? So the poetics in you or the poet in you already is aroused, right? That the one who receives the image of the world is not just the receiver, but through the imagination that's received through the world, the poet or the poet's imagination, the waters of the pool are actually creating the image that's being reflected in her. There's a kind of recursive loop. Like where does the tree begin and the pool end? Where does the pool begin and the tree end? Where does the poet's eye receive? And where does the world that the poet's eye see stop being the only world that exists? And it wouldn't, it only exists through the poet's imagination, right? It's only the waters of the pool. It's only the reflection in it that make the tree the tree, that make it its reality, right? So he does it by by saying um, kilo rak salmo, its image. He's playing already on the notion of imagery, right? It, it's not only its image or his roots that lie with her, but that she gives birth 
to the tree, right? So that's, that's what every poet, the, the poet's language create the world. What is the world independent of the poet's language? Of course you can make a distinction, but the poet is creating a world. And that is the fantasy dream of the poet's eye or the poet's creative spirit. That the poet's breast, which is the creative flow of life-giving water, is what in fact sustains the imagery that's coming into the eye. Like, is does, does the tree that I see exist independently of my sustaining vision that brings the tree into my consciousness? Right? Can you see what Bialik is struggling with as a poet? not just as a person describing and how he's using mirror imagery and pool imagery to talk about what it means to have a poetic imagination. Anybody have some thoughts about that? Because I, I think when he says, ach kulo gadeo, ach kulo gadeo hu betocha, its totality grows out of her. She's not just, you know, this is just the mind. The mind is not just receiving the image from the outside, but it is already recursively what the eye has seen outside. There's no way. This was that the question that we we're raising, right? Uh, that you that that you were raising. You know, do I create the world outside? Does the world create my imagination? And he's trying to cut that loop. That the world that I'm seeing is the world that's reflected in me. And that that is, is that the gift of God or the light that's shining into the pool? Or is that the light that has irradiated his inner eye or his, his inner soul? Right? That is what the poet is struggling with. Where does the truth of the poetic image, to go back to what you were saying, where is that truth? Right? And he's breaking down objective subjective, outside inside, by using outside and inside imagery, right? Or by using the pool uh, imagery. And this sense of zachta has this quality of religious merit to have this. It's not something that the um, that the poet's spirit can claim from naturalness. There's a kind of spiritual graciousness that's come to the poetic imagination. And that's what the pool is saying, that she has become a mirror for it, right? But to become a mirror for it means that she's seeing the world in a certain kind of way. Does this way of thinking about this imagery make sense to you, or would you prefer to see it as a nature image? Or I don't want to just turn this into poetic philosophy, but you see he's he's thinking, we said he's thinking as a poet. He's seeing the world and it's it it can't exclude the the cognitive epistemological issue of the truth of the image. The image is the world, but it was given to him by the world, but the world is only the reception of his poetic consciousness. Am I being a little bit clear? I hope. Anybody have some thoughts about that? You can see how it begins to border on religious issues. Um, okay, but we, we're getting to see what is the language of the poet, right? And what does he mean when he uses that, uh, the language that the tree is saying, flood me, enchant me, bind me, right? that the tree itself is experiencing light and then the tree and the light that's into the pool is also an enchantment. This is the, like, this is the inner consciousness. What he's, he's revealing is the inner consciousness. And what I find actually, and then I see Ido's hand, that, it, that, that I find so intriguing of, of, of what's really poetic daring. The poetic daring is, um, from the point of view of the end of the poem, he will tell us that 
he is trying to retrieve something that was lost in childhood. But in a certain sense, he's daring to say this from this more mature uh, state of consciousness. It's a paradox, right? Uh, he's, he's evoking, he's evoking loss through presence. Doesn't that, and that's what a poet does. He evokes loss through presence. And he's saying that the presence is only there because of himself, but he's not denying that there's an external world at the same time. Who has some thoughts about that? Or anybody who has any from a philosophical or psychological or poetic point of view, Oliver, why don't you begin? Just a quick question. Is the, the, um, the mighty one in this stanza? Could I that think that's, the, that's oak? the oak tree. That's the alone. That's the oak tree. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think. I think so. Because the, the, the pool is in the feminine. Yeah, Ido. Ido, you had a... Uh, yeah. For, I'm sorry to speak so much, so feel free. No, to... no, no. I want I want everybody to talk, please. And but, I'll give um, I mean, why why is the tone towards the end where he raises the possibility that the reflection is just constitutive of the thing itself? He's he seems extremely reserved and almost um, not scared, but almost you know he this uh, who knows mio dea it. it it repeats throughout the poem again and again. And also the pool is not thinking this or saying this, it's dreaming this and it's dreaming this in secret. It's like another layer of, you know, something hidden. Oh, but, he says, he, he, no, but he says, but he says, perhaps she is thinking this. So this, the Miodea is, who knows, is the poet's, this is the place where the poet is both simultaneously present and alienated. He doesn't, he's trying to reflect a sense that I don't fully know what the pool is dreaming, but he will say he knows at the very end of the poem. He will say, I once knew the, the imagination of the imagery that's being reflected. But at this point, he is, he's, he's presenting us the reality but he's not yet asserting that he knows the dream of the dreaming imagine. In other words, he, he's taking us to several other levels. It's as if um, there is reflection and then there's the dream work, right? What is the dream work of the poet that's related to perception? The dream yeah, but he's work, is, dream work is, 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 is my... Is, is the world that I'm seeing the true world or is it the world that I am projecting outward? And this is the poet thinking about what it, about poetic consciousness through his displaced projection about the brecha. He's using the brecha as a displacement of his poetic struggle of consciousness, isn't he? At least I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I think that's what the ulai is. That you're you're picking up very strongly. Umio dea, who knows? Ulai. In other words, there's a kind of subversion right within the assertion. Is that? I think that's what you're getting. At yeah, least that's yeah. what I'm getting. It just see. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of qualifiers here. Yeah, maybe exactly. in secret, in the dream, in the uh, so it, it's a he wraps it with a lot of uh, he's very cautious. And I'm just wondering, uh, I mean, yeah, it is it, it, a question about poetic representation, but then could it also be tied to you know what what are the especially on this question of the religious and the secular, what are the religious implications of saying that the world is is not fully there in its own? It's kind of just a uh, uh, all me. That is, that is, I'm, I'm, I assume so that's, that it's, that's, right, so that's what we're going to have to see. There's a givenness of God and the givenness of the poet. And does the poet give back in a certain way what God has given, but now in human language? Mm. Right? That's getting back to Anisa, the issue that we talked with Anisa. God gives the reality, but the language of, re, of this of manifest, this is human language. And the poet wants to believe that although 
the poet is putting it into human language it is reflecting the gift that's coming from without yeah uh, uh, adrian yeah, yeah to speak uh, in uh, marion like uh, language <laughs> He wants to erase his own givenness and uh, become part of the greater givenness in a way. Because I think the big issue of the poem the, is uh, he, he cannot escape speaking from the I, from the self. But he realizes that the self has to be erased or elided somehow. Uh, and I think because I, I, if I'm reading it correctly, the, the, the I disappears as the poem progresses. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this disappearance is, is crucial to him because he, I think, precisely doesn't want to say, oh, this is my projection and this is my imaginary world that I create. Uh, he wants to achieve that level of consciousness where he is a mirror, where he reflects. Right, and I was as as we were discussing. I was reading some Sufi poetry from um, that volume U Chicago has out, Islamic mystical poetry, and it's incredible. I mean, the the echoes are incredible uh, between this play, uh, the, uh, the mirror, the self, the pool, right? So, so in a way, I think he's he's looking for a different kind of poetic agency, and in a way, tapping into an agency that let's say the mystics clearly know, right? And, and because that's the big question, as you said earlier, how do you speak but avoid speaking uh, from selfhood or, 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 uh, or that yourself blocks the reflection of the givenness, right? So that, uh, uh, and, and which is which is not just a po a poet's problem. It's, a, it's, it's the point, it's the problem of a person with religious sensibility. Right, you want to reflect the truth of what's being given to you, which is coming from God. He will say he will use God language, but ultimately he'll also use what God creates as the manifest world, the play of forms. We'll see mm -hmm. that in a certain sense you can't get beyond the play of forms, and the true poet simply receives the play of forms that appear on the mirror, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you don't have to. Then you, you bypass the cognitive issue of what am I seeing? Mm -hmm. You simply want to be able to manifest in another way the play of forms that are playing upon you. And that way your ego has been suppressed, but there's enough of you that's able to kind of reflect something outward, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be dead to yourself or there's a quiescence to the self, but also something else. I think your, I think your point about uh, Marion and givenness and be part of the larger givenness. Um, but the poet, but, but what is the state of the giving? Benjamin, yes. Um, um, so on that point, um, there's, in trying to discover kind of more than the divine, I think also it's, it's important in this stanza that we just read that for image, he uses the word Salam instead of like, uh, Dimut. Right. That's nice. Um, yes, of course. Yes. Because, because this is particularly the word for image used associated with God and the image of God. Um, and so I think that he's, he's kind of, it's not his image or his roots alone within her lie. It's not just the divine image within the pool, but trying to look for more of a meaning that is kind of beyond the divine or a meaning that he through his personal eye can can imbue and find within the pool. Yeah. Uh, Beautiful, and I th I'm glad you're emphasizing that, Selma. So the, the real issue for the, for the religious or for the true poet is the nature of source. The nature of source. Is the source from the outside or the source from the inside? And how does the religious poet or the secular poet deal with the bimodality of source? So one of the things we were just seeing is to a certain degree to erase subjectivity as, as the projection, but simply as the receptor. Uh, so this notion of ulai perhaps is still the mind that's working overtime that maybe I'm the source of things. 
uh, and we'll try to have to get to a place where the where the mind can simply be a reflection of the God-given forms. To be a reflection of the of the God-given forms doesn't mean that I'm describing the forms or I'm comparing them to anything, because mm -hmm. then already I'm interjecting my. Which, that's one of the things that a poet would do, right? A poet wants to form an image and make comparisons between images. And we want to see where does he want to go? Does he just want to, to, a mirror only reflects. But at this point in the poem, he feels reflectivity as a source of his own intrusion, perhaps, of the dream of creativity. He hasn't yet got to the place of pure reflect reflection to be a pure mirror which is the higher level of religious and then poetic consciousness as we'll see for him at least i think so and then it, um you know there's, there's a point of receptivity that um that's independent of language and then language can at least say that that has happened <laughs> but it won't it won't try to describe what has been happening right, uh, to a certain degree. Um, let's do maybe one more, and then we, if we want, we want to take a little break, see how, um, how we're doing. We, we're gonna move from, from the morning to evening, right? We're gonna move to the um, evening light. So, um, Anissa, would you like to read that? You had a beautiful voice last time um, on, on a moonlit night. So we're moving so again, it's 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 the same locus, but how this change of light and the change of mood affect the reflection into the pool. Okay. Just to clarify, we're at four. On a moonlight night on page four. Okay, great. On a moonlit, on a moonlight night, when a heavy mystery lies over the wood and hidden quiet light filters through its branches, stealing passing over its trunks, embroidering there in silver and blue, embroideries of its wonders, hushed is every thicket, hushed is every tree. Each one darkness himself with his crown and meditates there secretly the meditation of his heart. The wood stands full of schemes, completely burdened with mystery, regal, glorious, singular, much honored and ancient, as if there, deep within the secret core of his might, on a golden couch, hidden from living eyes, sleeps in her very innocence, perfect majesty and eternal youth, a princess from ancient times who was bewitched. And the wood was charged to count her nostrils breath and guard in secret, watch the mystery of her virginity until the prince, her lover and redeemer comes and sets her free. At this hour, the pond granted or not granted, a liquid silvery ray from on high withdraws into the shadow of her many branched shield, grows doubly silent as if the silence of the wood and the glory of its mystery were doubled there in the mirror of her slumbering waters. Who knows? Perhaps secretly she dreams that the prince is roaming, wandering in vain, searching in primordial forests, in sandy wastes, and in the beds of seas for the lost princess. This hidden delight, this great radiance, is she not secreted here within her depths in the heart of the slumbering pond? Let's read that in the Hebrew, and then this is this amazing imagery here that I want to at least pick up here. Um, you know, if you'll read that. Yeah. Um, you know, over Leil Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Uvelel yareach, birvot ta'aluma, kveda ala chorish, veor ganuz harishi zolef ben afav, igdene veavor al gzaav, verokem sham bekesef u betchelet, trikmot plaav, vehas kol svach, vehas kol ilan, kol echad maafil al atzmo betzamarto, umearherlo betzinah hirgur libo. 
ועומד לו החורש רב מזימה, כולו טעון, סוד מלכות נהדר אחד, גדל, גדל יקר וקדמון. כאילו שם לפני ולפנים, מחוויון עוזו, על ארץ פז, מעין קול חי מוצנעת, תישן, בעצם טומאה, כלילת הוד ועלומי נצח, בת מלכה, מיני קדם שנתקשפה. והוא החורש הפקד למנות נשמות אפה, ושמור משמרת קודש סוד בתוליה, עד יבוא בן המלך, דודה גואלה וגאלה. הבריכה בשעה זו, אם תזכה ואם לא תזכה, בקרן כסף קלושה מגבוה, יתכנס לה בצל מגינה רב הפוערות, ומשנה דממה תדום. כאילו דמי החורש והדרת סודו נכפלים שם בראי מימיה הנרדמים. ומי יודע, אולי תחלום במסתרים, כי אך לשווא ישוטט, יטע בן המלך, ויחפש בירות עד בציות חול ובקרקע ימים, את בת המלכה העובדת. וחמדה גנוזה זו בזערה הגדול, הלא היא כמוסה עמה פה במעמקיה, בלב הבריכה הנרדמת. So let me just pick up on a couple of the, uh, the images here, uh, precisely because we're dealing with the moon. Um, we, we have shifted uh, the imagery uh, to, to the moon imagery of Jewish mysticism and the feminine imagery. The moon, of course, uh, is the feminine, not only because the moon waxes and wanes over the course of a month, um, gets pregnant and not, but also has its own monthly rhythm, which is one of the, but the moon is also the receptor of a higher light. So the moon in these mystical traditions is not the source of light, as would be the sun in masculine gender terms, but is the receiver, is impregnated, uh, is penetrated by the light, is more passive, um, and becomes the brecha. The brecha is the moon, is the imagery, etc. So the outer moon above and the pool as moon are two corresponding female images um, that are balanced. Um, I think the, uh, what I want to, uh, I want to highlight uh, two things. One is the language of medieval Jewish mysticism. The other is the way he uses a Hasidic story, Hasidic, uh, uh, these pietistic stories. Uh, I don't know if, if, if some of, he's playing on a narrative, which I'll describe, of one of the great Hasidic uh, masters of narrative, Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav. And which was known in Yiddish and was also known in Hebrew, Bat Malka Ha'avuda, the, 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 the lost uh, queen or the daughter of the king. Um, and this was, this would have been, this was well known to him. It was well known to that world. Um, it's uh, among the famous tales of Rabbi Nachman, the very first of the 13 famous tales. But let me first uh, deal with a couple of images so that make sure that you can see um, this. So, in the evening, uh, in the evening light, in the moonlight, Leil Yoreach, Birovotz Taluma. Here you have this kind of this imagery of crouching, this imagery of uh, overbearing, almost a sexual image of Taluma of the of a secret uh, overbearing that's heavy over the Chodesh. Notice in the second and third line, the Chodesh, which is the wood, is Harishi is again the silent forest. And what is the light of the moon? Is organuz. This is the most primordial imagery of primordial light. This is in all of the ancient from rabbinic times is the, is the, is the created divine light of the first day. In Jewish mysticism already from early rabbinic times, the first day is a created light but it is, it is a supernatural light that can't exist in the material world. So God withdraws that into a hidden place for the righteous, or it's a light that shines as a halo on the face of the righteous, or it appears in the eye of friendship and love, but it's the hidden light that's with God from primordial times until a person becomes worthy to see the world as a reflection of the aura of God. 
but we're not worthy in this world. So we see the world through the reflection of the sun and the moon, the created lights of the fourth day. So ancient mysticism pondering on the light of the first day and the light of the fourth day solved the problem by saying that the, the original light is a godly light. It's a transcendent light. It's a light that truly illumines things from within, but we only see the world through their externality, through their materiality, through the gashmi in the Hebrew, not through the ruhani, through the spiritual. And it's only when you can see the spiritual light, which is ganuz, that you have a mystical perception. Otherwise, we only see the reflected light that comes off the natural world, right? All, we, in our state of naturalness, only see reflected auras and lights from the natural world. But the inner light, which is the organus, is the mystic light that only a mystic can see. It's the divine core that transcends time and transcends diversity. Light can't be seen, but light makes everything seeable. So it's that inner core. So he says, this is the organus, it's a silent organus that filters down through. He's already has in this world, there's a mystical radiance that's descending off of the moon, that the light that's shining off the moon, he's saying, is not the light that's cascading down from the sun, the sun has set. It must come from God. It's already the moon on high for Bialik is like the pool down below. It's a reflecting lens of something primordial. So he's got the two moons, the, the, the upper world and the lower, the olam hafuch, the two things that are reflecting, right? The upper world is that mystical world of light that's shining through because that's where that light is coming off of the moon. The sun has set. So where could that, light, from his point, from the mystic's point of view, it must come from a divine radiance. And it's shining into the pool, which now the pool becomes, again, another reflector of this female imagery of light. And it steals down. And then it weaves this. And the, language, the imagery that he has, it's kesef utchelet. And this is the imagery of the embroidery of the curtain in the Holy of Holies. The colors of the blue and the vermilion and the gold and the silver. He's alluding to these earthly, but the imagery of that's in the tabernacle. That are heavenly lights that are being reflected, right? The rik mot pala'av are the weavings of God's wonders or the wonders of that light. That's the Pele, the wonder, the astonishment. That's what Pele is. It's the astonishing, because he's gonna come back to this at the end of the poem. All that a poet can say is wonder, right? That's the end. That's all you can really say if you're gonna use language, amazement, wonder. And the Rikma is the weave. So there's a very old tradition that God weaves the world or that the weaving on the tapestry in the Holy of Holies weaves the mystery of existence. And there are mystical traditions as well that, that when mystics ascend, they see the, the heavenly curtain above, which is woven with the fates of existence. The, the imagery appears also in the Iliad too in a different form of this weaving of the notion of weaving as a form of creativity. And then he goes on, which I wanna, uh, so the, um, the, 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 this, uh, the Oreach is, is dreaming and it's dreaming the heart and it's in this deep thick forest. And then it's the Sod Malchut Ne'edar Echad. What, it is the mystery, regal, glorious, et cetera, et cetera. It's the, the hidden mystery, the sod is the supernal mystery of the kingship of God, which is in the queen. The kingship of God is manifest in the queen below, right? And the key, and this mystery is Gadol Yakar Kadmon. It's, it's a supernal mystery. It's primordial, Kadmon. It's primordial. Ki'ilu sham lifnai lifanim. 
it's shining down. What is lefnai lefmim? That is the rabbinic expression of the most hidden place that the high priest goes on the holy day of atonement and the holy of holies to go into the inner sanctum. That's called lifnai ulifnim. It's the inward part of the inward part. And only the high priest can go in and only once a year. And all the high priest says on that day is the divine name. It's the holiest place at the holiest time with the holiest word. And that's inward. It's the deepest inwardness of that light that's shining. You now he's playing on biblical Psalms, which is the hiddenness of divine glory. That is mutzna, that's hidden, et cetera, et cetera. And he describes this as klilat ho, that's the queen's crown. He's using the klila, which is the crown of the queen, the innocence, the perfect majesty, but it's really the queen's crown. And who is this Bat Malka? Who is the queen, the daughter of the king who has been enchanted? So let me just take, uh, I, I'm keeping my eye on the time. We'll, we'll maybe break in about 10 minutes, but I just want you to fill this in because Rabbi Nachman has this famous narrative of the Bat Malka Ha'avuda, the lost Bat Malka, uh, the lost queen, okay? But that narrative, which was a Yiddish narrative that used to be recited, that he presents as a, as a, as a, gift, as a wedding gift that you recite to the couple, is playing on very, very old Zoharic and mystical imagery. So let me just, I just want to just, so the larger background of that is that um, the queen below, the pool, who's the queen, is the daughter of the king. The king is one of the aspects of God on high. Um, God has a mask, has masculine modalities of presence and female modalities of presence. The queen is an aspect of the receptivity, the impregnation, the birthing quality, uh, the life process that changes with the moon and the days of the week. It's the Sabbath that's constantly changing. It's the possibility of light. That's, that's part of what the moon is. But the moon is also the holy temple. It's that holy of holies. But when the temple was destroyed because of sin, or from the point of view of the poets, because of misperception, because of idolatry, because of the inability to deal with the sacredness in the proper way, the temple was destroyed. And in medieval Jewish mysticism, the destruction of the temple symbolizes, is the symbol of Israel in exile. Israel in exile, is the symbol of cosmic or ontological alienation. So Israel's exile and scatteredness across the world is the symbol of dislocation in the ontological sense for Jewish mysticism. It's the sparks of light that were broken when the moon was shattered and the temple, which is so the moon and the temple and the pool are symbols of this broken crystal that scatters and that gets lost and dispersed throughout all of existence. And Israel becomes the cosmic, the symbol of that cosmic brokenness, the shever. It's a symbol of this shvirat hakelim, this breaking of the vessels in which the light which is the, when, in which the primal light, which had come down through all the channels and which was reflected into the holy temple and which was reflected in the moon is now scattered and broken and seized by all the forces of evil, which is the material world that covers up over the holy light. So the external world are these things that seize and in he uses the term uh, that she was enchanted. Now, there was a spell that was put on the sacred. The sacred was dispersed. The world that we 
experience as subject object, the world that we experience as diversity, the world that we experience as brokenness, from the mystical point of view is the scattering of light. It's the brokenness of the temple. It's Israel in exile. It's cognitive dissonance. It's the mixture of good and evil. It's everything that it's not wholeness. It's diversity, waiting redemption, which is integration, bringing things back, bringing the light back to its source. Now, from Rabbi Nachman's narrative, um, and you can probably find this online by the, the Lost Princess. There's a beautiful translation of this that was done by Arnold Band in um, the Paulist Press series uh, on the uh, uh, tales of Rabbi Nachman. The, the Lost Princess is one of the 13 stories um, uh, that, that appear, but it, it, it's in Hebrew and um, in Yiddish originally, and then we have it now in English, but it became a classic uh, in 19th century literature that Bialik is using to describe the brokenness and the fragmentation. So what he says is that this pool dreams that she is like the Bat Malka, the king's so there's a mixture, just like in the Song of Songs, that the bride and the daughter, the imagery overlap here too, the daughter of the king and the bride have a kind of overlapping symbolism. I can't go into that, but it's not incestuous. It's just overlapping uh, images uh, of the feminine, of the queen, the bride, the daughter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, she, but she, she's dreaming of in the last line in the, the second to last line in the Hebrew, or let me go back three lines before. Ushmor Mishmeret Kodesh Sod Betuleha. She is guarding the secret of her virginity. So, so what he's saying is that there's something in the queen that's preserving something holy, something intact, something that has not been broken, something that has not been sullied. The virginal queen represents. Um, uh, uh, the same as in Christian imagery, the, Mary as virgin represents the perfection before the before uh, anything. It, 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 there's a kind of innocent perfection, right? And that is this Bat Malka, who's reflect. She's her dream of her virginity. Of course, she's past the virginity at this point. But the dream of the virginity is because she had she had been coupling with the male king. There had been a unity of opposites, of male, female, of king, queen, right? There had been that. When the world was whole, all these dimensions were in dynamic correlation. But when they're separated, the king, the king goes searching for the queen. That's what is happening. The Doda, her beloved, is searching the world for the lost holiness and intactness of feminine purity, which becomes the image of wholeness of perfection, of virginity. So the king is now also seeking, it's not just Israel that's scattered, the king is seeking out the queen, or it's Israel that's trying to find sparks of light within the darkness of existence. So she's dreaming of her beloved, the prince, who's her lover and redeemer who will set her free. So according to the narrative of Rabbi Nachman, the, um, the king sends a vizier to, to go to seek the queen and she, he's going, and um, at certain key points, it, he almost comes to find her and he falls asleep, which is a sense he, his mind gets distracted. He thinks about something else. Falling asleep is the distractedness of mind. So the mind wanders, falls asleep. Um, it no longer can pay attention to the true reality. And so then he has to start the search all over again, and it, which becomes the spiritual search. The spiritual search is, is staying focused and awake, right? And as soon as you fall asleep, you get distracted or you're in a dream world. So um, this is... The Brecha, she's dreaming that he's going to come and that he's going to come in, and all the language of silence that appears here, and that he's going to come in, he's going to find his reflection in her mirror, which will become 
the conjunction of opposites. It will become the face that's seen in the mirror, which means the face and the mirror become one. Right? There's no distinction between the face and the mirror. They become one because they're not reflection. They just they they've joined in a certain sense. The male female, right? There's a unity of opposites. The couple has have have joined. And then what does she dream? She dreams that he will wake up to the fact that he's searching in the wrong place. She's right here. She is a reality. But she's dreaming that he'll wake up to realize that he's wandering the wastes of the world, which means he's wandering in dispersion. He's wandering in subject object. He's wandering in difference. He's wandering in good and evil. And he, he doesn't realize that there is a place where the holy can be found if he can reorient himself to it. He's lost the magnetic hook to the holy. And she's, she, is, she is the dream of holiness that's waiting to be found. She's the pearl, right? The hidden pearl of wisdom. He used other kinds of imagery. So, and and now we, we, she has it. So he says, so that he'll find her and his wanderings in the forest, right? And now the forest imagery has changed, right? It's all of this light that's coming down, that's dazzling and moving this way, but it can't really find it, its coordinated gaze into the pool, right? It's a series of, reflections that are reflections. It's the moon reflection that's coming down through the trees and it's, and it's bouncing up something else. And it, it's, it's not quite an unified uh, image. So that, that, and that unified would be the capacity of the feminine to reflect back to the masculine. And then that is, that is the holy marriage. That's the holy marriage, right? Uh, the conjunction of opposites. Uh, that's, so it's, and that's when the third line, so the third, for the, um, for the lost princess, Bat Hamalka Haoveded. So she is, she is, she's lost, but really means that she's lost to consciousness. She's lost to the one who's seeking, right? It's not like she knows where she is, but she's lost to someone who's seeking. Um, the, uh, the hidden delight, Chenda Genuza, so it's playing on that organuz, right? The, her loveliness, in her great Zohar, her great illumination. Isn't, isn't that hidden? Isn't that bound? Kamusa Poima? Is that already with her? He's searching for light in all of the. Um, the pilgrimage is a distorted pilgrimage because he's only finding all of these refractions um, in, you know, he has no roadmap. But the light is already contained there in the pool, in her. Halohik chemusapo. She is the source of hiddenness and wholeness. Bema makeha, in her depth. These are all mystical images. Belev habrecha hanir demet, in the sleeping pool. So this is the, this is the, she's dreaming the dream of being found, the dream of perfection the dream of the sacred marriage, the dream that her lover will come, which is the end of alienation. For the poet, it's the, it's the absolute and most pure reflection of the outer world onto the mirror of his heart, isn't it? So he's, he's reflecting outward the brokenness of reality and he's reflecting personally that he's seeking the images everywhere, except where they need to be found by purifying the lens of his perception. But he's not, not only just speaking as a poet creator, he's speaking as a religious person and he's speaking epistemologically. And then he's also speaking using the lim imagery of that world of the external world. So this is the Bat Malka. And it says, so he, he seeks her forever, right? That's, this is, uh, the forest now is not simply the place where the light shines through, but the Yarot is um, the place of our distorted pilgrimage in the world. We can't find our way among the forest. We don't know the way to the inner center, which is the Brecha. So you can see now he's already using 
again, what I'm trying to make you see is that he has layers within layers and that these are they're converging. Um, and at one level, it's the imagination, it's the other level of its religious consciousness, at the other level is the perception of the world. Um, and it's because at this level, when you begin to use all of this language, it's a kind of converging series of facets, right? It's the question of where the light is shining in, how the refractions come out of the poem in different ways, right? It's not just, and that becomes that pool. And what he's waiting for, as we will see, is, um, is, is, the, purest, is the purest vision, which is to say, when the face and the pool are one, right? And there's no distinction between, well, you can't even talk about image. You just talk about uh, manifestation. Before, before we take a little break, anybody, uh, is any, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? Beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. But you see, he's, he's so skillful. Um, the question is what you would know if you didn't know all this background. But once you know this, you feel how the poem is vibrating at so many levels, so many levels, and not least the struggle of a poet who in a sense has lost his faith too, right? It's all of this, but it's, um, so let's take, uh, I have five of, um, let's, should we take 10, 15 minutes? How about 15 minutes, would that be okay? To give you a, a little bit of a break. So let's go until, We'll meet again at 10 after and we'll go for another 15 minutes. I think we may want to carry this over into next time because there's some, uh, I don't, is this okay that we're going this slowly? Because I think that you can, you can feel this poem uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. Great, great, great. Um, all right, all right. So that's, we're, we're getting a little bit of the, of the Hebrew depth of this, uh, despite it all. All right, so, um, Let's meet up in 15 minutes and uh, see you soon. Okay, don't, don't click out, just click up your video.
recording. I can shut off the recording. So some, you know, sometimes there are these weird convergences. So I was, I was uh, looking back over a book. Uh, maybe Adrian already knows it. This person by the name of Robert Pogue Harrison, uh, who teaches Italian actually at Stanford, had written an interesting book on the notion of gardens, and he also much earlier wrote a book on forests. The primordial. So I was going back to take a look at that to see how he was talking about primordial forests, how forests function in daily. And um, I'm not a computer maven by any chance. So by chance, uh, a, um, a review by him appears where he's reviewing the, uh, auto, the biography of Maurice Blanchot, the, uh, the French philosopher and writer. And the image, on the review was a stunning. It was, it was an image um, by, by Stieglitz, the photographer. And the image is called Songs of the Sky. And I looked at some of the Getty images of Songs of the Sky, and it is the most amazing photographic representation of the section of the poem that we're about to look at of storm and dark and light. So if you get a chance um, uh, after we're done, I'm, I'm sure you're probably all going to be doing it now because even though I, even though I can't see you, but it's by, by Stieglitz. Um, um, I, I'm sure you know some of his, his photography, but it's called Songs of the Night and a couple of the night storm. Um, if anybody knows whether if there's a book about it or a thing, uh, it, it, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen, hello, oh, Anissa, wait a minute. You found it? Uh, can you, is there a way to show it on the, um, I guess that must, is that the Getty imagery? Yeah. Can you see, can yeah, you see yeah. the imagery that, can everybody see that image? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's very. Is that the one with I mean, the with the style? If you yeah. press, huh? I'm not going to do anything because I, I don't. I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm not going to touch anything. But yourself. Wait a minute. Ido, Ido's coming in. Let me just get him in. Um. So where did Ido come in? I think he's coming in somewhere. Um. So did 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 uh, where did you find it on the Getty images? Um, it's on getty.edu. Um, so if anybody can find out, uh, Ido, what we're doing is that I said that last night I found some, um, some uh, photographs of, of Stieglitz called um, uh, uh, Songs of the Night, which have this kind of night imagery that we're seeing about the section of the poem we're dealing with. And uh, Anissa already found it. And, uh, um, <laughs> so she sent a chat so you could um, but if anybody knows of a book or a where if it's ever been put into a collection, I'd love to, I want to uh, find it. Uh, I've been at the Getty Museum, but uh, they don't always have, it's the one, it's in, in, in uh, near, uh, near LA, but it's, I, uh, I've never seen that, but they have some amazing um, uh, photo images. Has anybody ever, can everybody see it? I mean, you guys all probably know how to do this stuff, so you're probably all looking at it. Um, I hope you're looking at the one that I saw last night, but it's pretty powerful, isn't it? If it's the same one. Is it a black and white? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the black and sky on the top um, with, with light shining in from the sides. I, I, there, there were a number of them, but there was one that was ex exceptionally powerful. And I don't, um, anyway, if you can, um, I felt I, I had very rarely felt that you could, I could be looking at something and then be looking at the poem and the two things were uh, so deeply correlated. Yeah, oh, wait a minute, Mattel's coming in, let me get him. Let me get him. Yeah. So, wait, so, all right, so I guess, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Adrian just sent something. I, which, one you, which one are you showing? Can you show, can anybody show it? To, uh, all I mean, if you press, I mean, only the whole. I don't want to do. I don't want to do anything. I, I am so. I'm oh, okay. so. I'm afraid I will end up uh, clicking out of the whole thing, and I don't want to do that. Um, okay. But it may, uh, Adrian, if you find uh, something, story, if, story, if you can send me, story. you can send me the link independently after we close. I can find it. But if everybody can show it to each other, because I know you guys know how to do these things. 
Okay. I think I found the correct one. There are multiple, but yeah, yeah. You know, Getty images looks more like what you're describing. So I it had it had a big dark sky, then there's some light shining in different, and it, it was a storm. But it was the mm -hmm. it's the stanza that we're dealing with. <laughs> Can everybody see it? Are you guys all able to do it? What do you think? Pretty pretty powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, his uh, his lover was George O'Keefe. You guys know that. Yeah among other things. Or like I should say, her lover was Stiglitz. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, at points when they were together, they were each other's lovers, but they all had other lovers, I think. <laughs> but um, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think it's kind of an amazing, amazing thing. I'm glad you, I am glad you guys like this. So if anybody can send me uh, the link that will be good. I, I I'm just too frightened that I'm I will click on right. so, yeah. and then I would not click. <laughs> all right, all right. So let's take a look at this. Yom uh, Hasara, the day of the storm, the storm, the storm. Of course, the word the storm uh, evokes, of course, the book of Job, right? And the storm, the, the word, the God comes, the whirlwind. The Sa'ara is the whirlwind too. Uh, <laughs> Are, are we done with the yeah. previous poem? I don't know. I don't know. If you want to, anybody want to make any comments about it? I, uh, I'd be happy to hear anything you have to say before we look at the poem. Is it uh, before? I mean, my one thing that came to mind is uh, that the the other so so called myth or or motive that he might uh, employ is that the the idea of looking for the Sheikh Kina who is lost, right? That, it, yeah. Oh, that, that well, that is the Shekhinah. Oh, I, I thought that, I, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear, but the no. Bat Malka is the Shekhinah. The Bat Malka is the Shekhinah. Oh, I think Adrian, you yeah. froze. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I'm sorry I didn't make that explicit. I yeah. guess. And, 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 yeah, and this, no, and this encounter, which he, in a way, replaced this mystical, motive in a poetic manner right and and again like in the previous poem last monday it's only for lack of a better description in a you know right it it's not how do you achieve that moment of consciousness that encounter that chirotic uh, coming together um and and he he tries different i think avenues but, and he, need, he, I think the poetic way for him is always, as you said, looking for the sparks that are spread out and, and hidden. Uh, and, and there's both spark, they're hidden, but also there are, they are mirrors, right? Yeah. So in a way, he cannot do it by himself within himself. So it, it, he has to go out, as it were, and, and start collecting these charts the sparks so that, that, that's so the um the spiritual pilgrimage um um is the search for the hidden light that that's that's really the archetypal image the search the the way outward the way inward is the way outward um well the ontology of existence now is that the perfected light of creation is now concealed so we're gonna when we get to bialik's uh, revealment and concealment we're seeing that the the external world is the is conceals the hidden light and only the person so it it's i mean we should wait to, to get there but the way i uh, one way to one imagery that appears in um later jewish mysticism is the question was where was the organus hidden, according to one Hasidic master? It's hidden in the light of the eye, when you can perceive something in, a, in spiritual terms. Um, and so in a certain sense, we're dealing the ontology of spiritual perception. So a, an artist, of course, would try to and just try to understand the, the illumination of color that's being reflected by a deeper light from behind we, uh, the world. And the, the, uh, the, the seeker 
wants to find the divine light, which is the remnant of, of, whole, of wholeness in the external world or in language, right? So it's being able to see in the world itself that law or a refraction of that lost light. And uh, um, that's particularly a, a motif in, in modern Hasidism from the 19th century on of finding that in language, in the natural world, and knowing how to see it. Because otherwise you simply see the, the externality of trees and you don't see the hidden light that's shining through it. So the, the seeker is trying to cultivate that inner consciousness, which allows perception to have, perceive the radiance that's elsewhere. Otherwise you see the world in flat black and white terms and not in terms of the deeper, the deeper sense. Yeah. So, all right. So let us maybe, uh, so if other ideas uh, occur to you um, about this, please mention, but I, I, I'm sorry, I, I think it was just too much in my head that I didn't say that, that Shrina is the, is, the, is the queen, is the daughter. The, the, the word Shrina means imminence, it means presence, right? But it's the lost, it's the, it's, it's the imminence that can't be immediately uh, perceived, right? So cultivating the, so that's what, so in a certain sense, from that point of view, what the religious person and the poet does is trying to cultivate the inner eye, right? The inner eye means be able to deal with your own ego, which is your own ego eye, and which is a, one of the classic problems of issues of religious mysticism so that you can see what it can shine from, uh, from the divine depths, which is to say the lost wholeness of things. Can you see from within, can you see the wholeness within multiplicity? That's the issue. And the, 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 the wandering Malka, the wandering Shechina um, reflects the fragmentation of perception, right? Or that, that the wholeness of the eye would be able to hold diversity within the light of wholeness. It's not like, right, it's a, you know, and then it's a question of figure and ground, right? But that's the different ways that we're going to be dealing with it. But Bialik, Bialik is, that, that's where I'm still, I'm trying to, I'm trying myself, trying to think through um, the ontology of a poet who is using both, right? Um, in other words, if, if you're thinking about classical Jewish mysticism or Christian mysticism, the language of creation means that the ontology of existence is divine. But when you're dealing with language that's no longer divine and it's no longer part of God's created world, what is the ontology of the poetic creation? So the poet doesn't want it to simply be an idol. He wants it to be a reflection of the glory, right? Whether it's the glory of God or the glory of existence, whatever. But he doesn't want it to be a reflection of ego, mm -hmm. right? Or pure creativity. So it's a, it becomes a problem. For, for, for religious culture, it's not a problem because the ontology of existence and the ontology of language is the same, right? God creates the world with speech, with language, with words, which means that all language and the world are invested with a kind of primordial light of holiness, right? Uh, but that's not the pro that's not the way a secular person sees things. And then what happens when the secular person uses that language? What is the ontology? So I'm I'm personally struggling to try to figure out a uh, a poetics. Um, a, a mystic, uh, an ontology of language for the religious poet who's secular. Um, we, and, I, and at a certain point, the problem gets effaced because I, you know, no, I, I, it just may be wrong headed to say that these kind of people are not religious. I, I would agree. But um, since they, there's a use of traditional language by non traditional people, it highlights how we understand the religious quality of what's going on, at least. For me, but anybody who can help yeah. me as I'm trying to think this problem through, I love but, to hear your thoughts. Having, 
having heard you speak, isn't that something that Hasidism could, let's say, accommodate? Someone like Menachem Nahem, where you have the, where the, this Shekhinah is, goes, is so deep into all kinds of circumstances. And, and going down is, is part of the, the process. You're right, right. But, but that is an ontology, that's a religious ontology that God who creates the world creates the world with speech, which means that language itself is a reflection of divine holiness. So the ontology of the world and the ontology of speech are simply relations to each other. That's why, the, uh, that's why scripture is an ontology of creation and language, et cetera, et cetera. But what is, what is the ontology of Bialik's language. He's a, he's a secular mystic in a certain sense, and, um, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to simply impose light on the world. He wants to receive the light. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get at it, but not in, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not making a fight. I, I'm trying not to make a false distinction that you have to be a traditional person to be religious. Obviously not, I don't believe that. But it's a question of trying, how do you define a religious poetics um, that is not, that, that is um, what Zeno would call profane mysticism. Profane simply means secular, right? Sacred and profane mysticism. So um, anyway, you might want to be thinking, I want to, we'll probably be coming back to this, um, both in some of the, his, in his theory of language that we're going to deal with and uh, some of the other poems. Anyway, it's, it's on my mind. So anybody um, has some thoughts, please shoot them out um, to me. So let's do the one on the storm. I, I think we need to stay with this poem a little bit more because it then ends with language. And um, I'm just, I think, um, let's see how far we get with this. It may be, I, I would like you, I was going to switch around to have you read Revealment and concealment is language next. But I, let's finish this poem next time and also look ahead at he, he, um, he sought and saw. He sits vinivka, okay? Now, as, as the syllabus. And uh, maybe we'll have to come back to this a couple of times because he deals with this issue of epistemology and language and the relationship between um, uh, consciousness and language. Uh, there's no good place for that poem. Um, but I just... Uh, I, I didn't want to, well, we'll see. Uh, so let's, Biyom uh, HaSe'ara, on the day of storm. All right, enter Stieglitz with uh, George O'Keefe hiding in the background. There you go. <laughs> Desert motifs behind, secret. Who'd like to read? A nice voice. Okay, Timna, go for it. And on a day of storm in the forest overhead already congregates a coven of clouds and battle is in their hearts. While still controlling, repressing their anger a moment with essential thunder their belly rages. Cloud to cloud like a herald of approaching evil. Sun flashes of lightning in haste. Prepare. And yet before the enemy is known or from where the enemy will come, the forest all in gloom stands prepared for disaster in the world. Suddenly, spark, lightning, the forest pales, the world glows. Crash, crash, thunder explodes, the forest quakes and seethes. Sixty myriad blasts of wind, seeing and yet unseen, with wild shrieks swarms over its mighty ones, grasps them suddenly by their crown, jerks them violently, beating their heads. Thunder upon thunder, from the midst of the storm comes the roar of the forest multitude, wild tumult, fierce clamor, like the noise of distant breakers heavy with water. Yeah, let's keep going. The Kulom, and it all says. And all says uproar, uproar, uproar. In this hour's commotion, the pond, surrounded by a wall of forest lords, still hides deep down in her depth the golden fish, and like a panicked infant on a terrid night, hides shuts tight his eyes under his mother's wings and blinks his eyes at every flash of sparkling light. So with contorted face, black waters glum, 
she withdraws into the shade of her many branch shield, all of her shuddering, shuddering, and who knows. If you tremble for the glory mantle of the forest's pride, for the summits of his split crowns, or does she grieve for all of the beauty of her hidden world, bright dreamed, clear imagined, that a sudden wind passed over and muddied, multitude of splendid visions, her heart's darlings, musings by day, musings by night, that a spiteful moment turned to wrath. Okay. So let's hear it now in the Hebrew and uh, those of you who can be reading it again in the English and try to, try to feel it the way the poet is giving it to us. The, um, the fear and the astonishment of the young boy who's feeling the storm, right? ביום הסערה על ראש היער נצברה כבר חשרת אבים, וקרב בלבבם אך עוד מתאפקים הם וכובשים זעמם רגע, ובסתר רעם תרגז בטנם, ואב אל אב כי מבשר רעה קרובה, שולח עם זה ברקים בחיפזון, איקונה, ובטרם נודע מי האויב, ואי מזה האויב יבוא, היער כולו קודר עומד מוכן לכל פורענות שבעולם. ופתאום זיק, ברק נור, היער חבר, העולם הבהב, הח הח, התפוצץ רעם, זה היער וירתח. ושישים ריבו פריצי רוחות, הרואים ואינם נראים, בשריקת פרעים פשטו על אדיריו, ויאחזום פתאום בבלוריתם, ויטלטלו מטלטלה, הלמו ראשם, ורעם אחרי רעם. ובא מתוך הסערה כל המון היער, רחב המולה, כבד צועות, כשעון משברים רחוקים כבדי מים. וכולו אומר רעש, רעש, רעש. בשעת מהומה זו, הבריכה, מוקפת חומה של אבירי חורש, עוד תעמיק לסתיר במצולותה דגי זהבה. וכיתנוק נבעט נחבע בליל זוועה, עצום עיניים תחת כנפי אמו, ולכל ברק נור מנצנץ יניד עפעף. כן אהבת פנים שחורת מים וקטורנית, תתכנס לה בצל מגינה רב הפוערות, וכולה רעד. רעד. ומי יודע, החרדה היא לגאון אדרת יער ולתעפות צמרותיו המבולקות, או צר לה על יופי עולמה הצנוע, בהיר החולמות, זך המראות, אשר עברו רוח פתאום, אשר עברו היא רוח פתאום ויעד, ויעקרנו, והמון חזיונות הוד, טיפוחי ליבה, הרהורי יום והרהורי לילה, ברגע זעם אחד שם לי קצפה. Thank you, thank you. So, so it's hard to zero in on a few things here. Um, um, surely we can, we can feel the, um, in, in the poet's language, um, perhaps you can feel the, um, the, the pulse, the, the heartbeat of a child fe feeling, feeling the, um, the, the, the war, I mean, the, this is again, mythic imagery that the clouds are clashing with the clouds, the gods are in heaven, they're doing ra'am, ra'am, right, hit pulses. All the language is this explosive sound language. And the poet is able to capture in the rhythm, the, um, the pulse beat of the child's fear, right? He's able, uh, and, and, and Ido, uh, uh, in the Hebrew is able to to capture uh, that the this this um, is the krav bilvavam the 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 uh, the battle in the hearts of the clouds is the battle in the hearts of the perceiver and the battle in the hearts of the perceiver will have its reflex in the pool as well so it's um, I feel at the first thing is this this um, this 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 breathing rhythm. This power and this thundering and this, because in many cases here he does what he doesn't do elsewhere. He repeats the same word over and again. Raj, 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 Kulo, Raj, right? It's a, it's a kind of a, um, a kind of a the um, Kulo Omer Raj, Raj, Raj. The it's it's like a um, sardonic. We say and it all says uproar, uproar, uproar. It's it's like a sardonic play on Psalm twenty nine, right? With the great the great. Uh, psalm of the imagery of God's uh, 
uh, wind and, and, and violet coming. And then it says, V'kulo omer kavod. It all says glory. It all says the glory of God. Right? Here it all says noise, thunder, fear. Right? That's, it's, that's what the child is fearing. And, 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 he's, and, it's, and it's coming. Um, and, and the voice that's coming is hikona. Again, a kind of an ironic notion. Hikona is he's playing, uh, those of you, some of you will know from the book of Amos. Hikon lekrakelokecha, prepare to meet your God. That's what hikona, prepare to meet your God. But now it's a kind of prepare the doomsday, right? It's, it's, it's like this feeling that the, the darkness and the cloud and the thunder and the flashing light and the booms and all of this is the, an apocalyptic moment prepared to meet your God, uh, in which you don't know, you don't know who is the enemy or what's going to happen, right? It's a kind of ironic, again, use of knowing. Um, and then all you, all you feel is zik brak nur, yan chabar. Zik is like, it's like the, the zapping of the thunder, the lightning, it's flashing, it's flashing. That's, that's, that's what the, he's here, is hearing and seeing that's happening. Ha ha, hit So he's, he, it's, it's, it's not quite onomatopoeic, but he's got that rhythm. Uh, and 60,000 myriad blasts of wind. Haroim ve'enam nirim. So he's, here he's done, he's turned this into um, uh, a, a mystical or mythic image, but it, it's actually playing on a midrashic phrase. So the, the, the Bible um, uh, has two different versions of the revelation at Sinai. Um, uh, one has um, uh, the seeing and one is the seeing of God, Roim Venirim. And the Midrash uh, um, sort of creates this kind of blending that when God manifests God's self, he was seen and the, the, the scene was unseen or the unseen was seen. And it captured this kind of a mystical moment. And he's using this um, in terms of the terror. So the wind grabs the trees by their, by their, um, by their, by the, by the tops of their hair, right? And shakes them around, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so all of this is kulo omer rash rash. That's the the great um, terror sound. And then when this is happening, where is the brecha? The brecha is the child within, right? It's this child that's 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 um, under the blankets with the mother, whose eyes are blinking in fear and a desire to be uh, cared for. That's blinks his eyes at every flash of the sparkling light. Contorted face, black watered thumb, she withdraws into the shade, and all of her shuddering, shuddering. That's the um, that that too is part of the um, of the whirlwind, right? It's part of um, what the poet has to see. It's what the spiritual consciousness has to see. The spiritual consciousness has to see that the reflecting pool doesn't just reflect the still sunlight. It doesn't simply reflect the dim azure rays of the moon. Uh, in this world, the pool reflects terror and horror and anger and fright. And the eye that wants to really reflect the world can't simply flee to the calm pool it has to also be able to receive this terror, this anger, this distortion, this, uh, this fright. Um, at least I think that's what I'm trying to understand what Bialik needs to know. You can't be a poet if you simply want to talk about sunlight, right? You have to, you have to be able to see, see the terror that's flashing down into the pool. You have to feel. You have to. You have to be able to reflect that fear. You have to have language that flashes. That's not just the the calmness of metaphorical descriptions that flashes and that uh, 
um, uh, that shakes. Um, and that's interesting. He, he again, don't forget, he's still on the outside. And on the outside, he's trying to imagine what is the, what is the imagination of the pool? Remember, he's still on that outside. Before he was, the pool was saying, well, you know, the, 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 king, the king doesn't know that I'm really here. And now the, uh, what he's dreaming is um, uh, thinking of the, of, the, of the trembling of the summits that are being broken or grieving for her, the hidden world, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, we, what, we, what we include here, uh, uh, which I would hope that you can also reflect on, um, is that the, the, the poet, and I think for the religious person, um, in addition to a desire to de-anthropomorphize the world, and to de-anthropopathize the world, you know, to, to remove the world um, that it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have form, it doesn't have feeling. The, the mythic consciousness, which is a child's consciousness, is very true. And um, uh, at least I'm trying to understand Bialik, uh, why does he reach to try to understand the imagination and the dream world of the pool. Because there's, there's something of the throbbing life that has imagination. There's something that he's trying, what, what is the feeling tone of the world, right? That the poet is trying to understand the pathos of the world. At least I'm trying to give this expression that the world is not simply a flat surface. The world is not, it's, it is and is not a throbbing heart. It is and is not a dream work. It is and is not a yearning. It is and is not a sorrow. It is and is not a wistfulness. In other words, that, uh, could a poet really exist without the kind of projecting the pathos into, into the experience of the natural world? And uh, I think that um, uh, Bialik, Bialik deals with that by trying to project his imagination into one imaginative core, which is the brecha. Does, does, does that, which is the most pure symbol of reflection, also have feeling, right? Uh, and of course, of course, it's being projected by a poet who's feeling this. He feels it as a child. He feels it as an adult. He feels it as a lover and a beloved. So I, I don't know quite um, the best way to get at the issue, but I think that it's, um, he talks about it's behir hachalomot. The pool is, is tsanua. It's, it's, it's modest behir hachalomot zachamarot, the pure of sights. As the wind goes over Vayak Renu and it muddies the waters. So even, even that, the, the, the uh, it's not a pure glaze, right? It's not, it's not pure. Here her yom here laila. There's something, rega zaam, there's something that is roaring beneath. So I don't know how you, how you feel about that. I, I think my, what I'm trying to understand what the poet wants to deal with is on the first case that what the poetic eye needs to understand is it has to feel the reflection of everything, including the storm, including feeling the muddied waters. Um, and that the poet also, um, a poet is also filled with pathos. And the struggle is, how can you express the pathos of existence without simply projecting feelings? It's a delicate balance, right? Um, uh, you, you, you want to give pathos to the perceptual experience, and yet you can't let that pathos take off on its own, because then it becomes um, uh, either mythic or childish or whatever. And there's a, there's a a point where you're trying to feel um, 
the, the inner rhythm of things that we only understand in our own psychological uh, language. But there's a boundary. There's, there's a kind of respect. There's a boundary of language that allows us to sense that there's pathos in existence. And we only can speak of pathos from the human perspective. And yet we know that that is just language that's trying to help us um, um, feel resonance. So a, a word that we haven't used so far is like, what does a, when a poet is looking, one thing that a poet wants to do is to see manifestation. But the other thing that a poet wants to do is to feel resonance, right? And to feel resonance, opens the door to what we would call anthropopathism, those project, this sense of feeling tones that are coming through. Um, so anybody have any thoughts about that? You don't have to accept what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm trying to think out loud with you about how, uh, trying try to feel what are the boundaries of speech that make this, the, the, um, he hasn't yet got to the stage, let us say, of being simply a pure reflection, which would be at the end of the poem. He's still at the level of language. So this, can there be a, a, this kind of poetic language without feeling tone, without resonance? That's, what, that's the question I'm asking. I can't answer, well, I'm answering it by asking the question. Anybody have any thoughts? Does it make any sense? When uh, there is a lot, I mean, it seems to me there's a lot of Kabbalistic language in here, right? When he says, for the summits of his split crowns, uh, is, is it, at least in English, maybe that it's a misreading. Where, where, where are we? Uh, we didn't get there yet. Well, did we, did we, did we uh, uh, remind me where the translation was? That this is page 10. Uh, page 10? Yeah. No, uh, oh, 10. Um, Does she tremble for the glory mantle of the forest prize for the summits of his split, cro split crowns? Yeah, well, um, there it's it's less. It's toafot samrotav hamavluk hamavluk lakot. So the, it's, um, the, the toafot, it's very hard to know because the, um, uh, in the book of Numbers in Bimidbar, the Toafot Re'im, that the, 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 the water buffalo has these kind of manifestations, the Toafot Re'im, right? Uh, um, uh, and the Simrotav are these, um, um, the, the Tzameret is the, the whole crowning of the upper trees. And Hamavula Kot is that they're split, they know they're, they're crashing apart. So here I don't think there's, Mm -hmm. It's not Kabbalistic language uh, here. Um, but when he says, Charlie al Yafi Olama Hatsanua, is she is she mourning um, her 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 um, her 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 maidenness of her quiet maidenhood? Um, so it's it's the poet's he, the, what's interesting here is the poet is allowing himself to project himself out loud. There's a, there's a projection of, of uh, what he was saying was the, the, possible, the hypothetical. There's, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, if, but there are other terms here that are more mystical. Behir achalamud, the behir is, is a shining light. Zachamarot, the purity of, of, of vision. Right. Um, the hamon chesionot hod, uh, echoing. Ezekiel, or in the end of Deuteronomy, Hod, which is a kind of uh, 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 an, an oratic splendor. That's what the Hod is. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flooding of light that later comes into Christian art as halo, that back flash of light, of a primordial light, which is the halo of illumination, of holiness, the organus in a sense. Or well, the, the imagery goes back to ancient Mesopotamia, Sumerian literature, actually. Um, so, anybody have any other thoughts? Just um, yeah. thinking a little bit about the chronology of everything we've been reading. Um, last week, we read um, um, Echad Echad, 
<clears throat> where there seems to be a lot more of anxiety uh, surrounding poetic language. And I think it's a, actually a later poem. Than this yeah, one. yeah that, that was from 1915, 1415. This is from 1905. Um, I sort of have put, uh, I took them out of historical sequence, um, uh, most, mostly to kind of deal with a progression of allowing speech to happen. Remember, he, end, he, he feels he's lost speech and he waits for that silent emerge, uh, eruption of language, uh, of sound, of inspiration. And that's where this one's going to end and that it's going to lead us to it sits vinifka, have a mate, and then. Uh, the other essay. So I, I put them together out of historical sequence. I, to be perfectly honest, um, I can't understand what was going on in his head um, in the sense that just two years before this, he writes, you know, Ira Hariga or Al Hashkita, he's writing about the absolute the murder of the pogrom in Kishinev in 1903, and he spent the whole year there. And we have records of the horror that took place uh, in Kishinev. And he wrote two years before this, the most astonishing dirge of death and mourning of the brutality of rape and killing of Jewish life in Kishinev that we had since the 12th and 13th century of the medieval poems of lament. Um, it's an astonishing, two, two of them. And he spent a whole year in Kishinev for the uh, Yiddish Ethnographic Society doing testimony, which, he, which was only published after he died. So here's a person who's also steeped in this horror, and then like a year later, he's writing a poem like this. I, 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 I just can't, I, I just don't understand. So I can't, so I, so he's saying we don't, I don't, the, the sequences, I, 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 I just don't, I don't know. But there, are, there are a lot of things. I, I've lived with some of his stuff a long time, but some of these uh, things that went simultaneously, I don't, I don't know how a human being can hold a childhood innocence, and rape and torture together in such proximity, I, I, so I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, the greatness of his uh, poetic imagination exceeds anything I can understand. Um, and each, each has its, its, its own pure voice. The voice of those poems of the, the horrendous pogrom in Kishinev, um, uh, it, it, it is, um, is a tone that's so totally different from this. Uh, I wouldn't even begin to describe it here in this short context, but uh, it's a tone of, of anger and despair and vitriol. Um, uh, uh, and here there is still the, the problem of innocence and poetic speech and is language sufficient? Uh, obviously, he's carrying all of these things at once, um, and um, perhaps maybe the underlying thing is what Anissa in her paper picked up on the issue of melancholy. If there's anything about Bialik, is an enormous inner sorrow, um, and that sorrow takes place through loss, loss of faith, loss of mother, loss of life. Um, there's a, and he also even, even, yeah, yeah, stops yeah. writing completely. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that's it. Is, How do you is, kind of that? that, that his, at a certain point, he becomes silent. Maybe we can talk about that at the end. I, I, I uh, there, there have been lots of theories about that. I, um, but at a certain point, he stops writing poetry after the First World War, and then very little, and does other kinds of things. Maybe we'll talk about that when we deal with some of his writings about language. Um, but, um, uh, and as you indicated earlier in the, in the session, he is at this time also writing his autobiographical reflections that he was asked to do by Klausner. And he writes about his, the village life in, in Russia. So I, 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 uh, um, I don't know. I mean, 
he's sitting there in Kishinev and he's also uh, falls in love with another woman on the veranda. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how it, how it all hangs together. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but so, but all I can say is um, his his language and his tone is always pitch perfect for the what he is what he is focused on, and um, you know, and where he receives his the the gift of that is something. Uh, astonishing. Um, I, I, I just to give you one other thing. Uh, look, I don't think we understand the whole business. I, I was as I was going over the poem yesterday. Um, I, there was a line that I was looking at, and it was ringing a funny bell, and it was reminding me of of a poem by Ibn Gabirol from the 11th century. I'll show it to you next uh, week when we look at that. And in the 20s, Bialik collected some of the Spanish poems of Ibn Gabiro. And so I figured he, he is almost, all, the language is almost identical. So I went back to look at his edition of the poems from the early 20s and his notes. And you would not think that the man had ever read the poem. So there's a lot of concealment. <laughs> he had the poem so deep inside him. He, oh, well, he cites it verbatim. And yet you're reading and the note says something like, I think that the editors have mixed up the lines and we don't know what it means. Oh, baloney, it was not. He knows exactly what it meant because <laughs> he, he transformed it and he didn't want to give that away. Uh, I, I, I don't know, yeah, you know, I really don't. Um, uh, so great, great people have, um, have, have many rooms in their soul, I guess, I don't know. Uh, and uh, somehow um, they can walk from one room to the other. I don't know how it's done, uh, but um, so that's simply to answer the fact that I uh, the, um, the I put them together because I wanted to focus on lament and lyric and language, and um, they are out of sequence, but there is a thematic bridge between the two. Um, but the other thing is that each each one, whether it's a lament of rape or it's a lament of childhood, the the language he chooses is unbelievably pitch perfect. And the rhythm is pitch perfect. Uh, so I don't know. Um, he has all of that complexity. He has all that complexity. He's a, a man who is the pool that could feel the storm and the light and the distortion. Um, yeah, all of that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so I think, let's, let me just tell you what I think we should do next time. Um, I'm going, what I will do is we'll um, very quickly do the dawn part and then jump to the bottom of page um, 12 in English about his delight. And that, that will take that all the way into um, his reflection on language. And then I think um, we'll see how, look at, he, he, um, he saw, he gazed and died. Hopefully we'll get to that. Outlet. But uh, I think that there's a, a plenty that we can reflect. The other thing that I'd like you to do, um, uh, and maybe people can be thinking about that, we didn't have a chance to discuss the Rilke poem about the forest, the forest um, uh, pond, which is, he talks about uh, the, the doubling of above and below and the trees and the light shining down. Even though, uh, so Rilke was writing this in 1914. This is written 10 years earlier. And he did, obviously didn't know Rilke's poem. But it might be interesting to go back and take a look from a comparative literary point of view, how two great romantic poets deal with the, the imagery of the lake in the forest. Mm -hmm. 
and the imagery of reflection and the imagery of light in trees. And they're similar and not similar because they, they're totally different sensibilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about a little of that too, mm -hmm. but a little from the point of view of comparative poetry um, mm -hmm. about that. Anybody? Um, any another, other? Yeah, yeah. As you were talking, uh, another interesting poetic parallel is Whitman, maybe, uh, and that might point into some direction of your question about this cosmic but secular, let's say, non-religious or immanent pantheistic or panentheistic mysticism, because you have that in Whitman very much. I mean, he's yeah, right, 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 and, and, and yeah, right. So maybe if, if you can, if you, if you think of something, you can send me. I'll take mm -hmm. a look at uh, at Whitman. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a, a very cherished collection. Yeah, and, um, it's actually, I think it was originally his, his book. I'll bring it up. I'll show you downstairs. Another my life. thing about Whitman is that Whitman as well has uh, gone through the trauma of the Civil War. Uh, yes, and, yes, and, yes. Right, right. And, so in a, in a very interesting way. With, but he too is reflecting this kind of uh, true mysticism. And, and he's writing after the First World War. And he was a medic. And he dealt with... Um, yeah. So that's it. Uh, he was, yeah. So that's, that's interesting in terms of that parallel. If anybody uh, can, I'll take a look at some, if people find something, we'll, we'll share that. Maybe we'll do a little, maybe we'll do the, let's do the Bialik and look at Rilke and maybe we'll find a, one of the poems of, um, uh, 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 from Leaves of Grass. Um, uh, and, and uh, we'll, we'll do that next time. We'll, let's, we'll save gaze and say, I think, uh, we'll, we'll, that will give us a kind of thematic coherence as well. Is that, is that good? Everybody, is that be okay for people? All right, so if anybody actually can find a, a poem that you like from Leaves of Grass, um, send it to me, uh, make a copy of it, and I'll, I'll choose from what you guys are finding, and I'll, I'm going to look for one, and uh, it'll allow me to go back to my... Uh, I, I found, I, found a, I think it was his one of his copies in San Francisco many years ago, and I'll, I'll bring it up. I don't know how I was lucky to do that, but I'll bring, and then I'll, I was going to show people my, my Rilke one too, but all right. So listen, let's, so if you find one of those, uh, please send them and, and I'll make a selection. And if I don't choose one that you have found, you can bring in yours in the discussion. The other thing is um, uh, anybody who finds the, a good, the, the Stieglitz, uh, Share it around with everybody so we can all um, uh, have 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 some shared shared amazing thoughts about that beautiful imagery. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a nice week. I look forward to seeing you guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.